Hello everyone and welcome to Crown Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic, we review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sabba Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Today we are going to have a look at a paper that was recently published in JAMA Surgery entitled Quality of Life and Patient Satisfaction at 7 Year Follow-up of Antibiotic Therapy versus Subpendectomy for Uncomplicated Acute Appendicitis. And this is followed by a teaching session by Professor Sababala Subramanian on uh, uh, clinical research types and designs. Great stuff. Okay then. Uh, so quite interesting that we've chosen to look at this study. I think the number of different reasons behind it, but we're all in quite difficult times and a lot of us are doing general surgical on-call shifts and that's pretty much most of what I'm doing now. I'm not doing much else other than this. Um, and I'm getting quite nervous with the amount of appendicitis that we're seeing and that we're just not operating on and that we're treating with... Um, with antibiotics and with non-operative management. And I'm getting quite nervous as to the discussions that we're having with this subset of patients and whether this is ultimately going to have an effect on those patients' quality of life and whether they're going to be satisfied with this treatment or whether we should just bite the bullet and dress up in the FFP3 and, and, and treat appendicitis with appendicectomy. So we found this study um, looking at just that. It comes out of Finland, um, and it's looking at quality of life and patient satisfaction at seven-year follow-up of antibiotic therapy versus appendicectomy for uncomplicated acute appendicitis. And it's based upon a, an original randomized clinical trial. Uh, so uh, the aims of this study uh, was to determine patient satisfaction and their quality of life after they received either antibiotic therapy and or appendicectomy for treatment of uncomplicated acute appendicitis. So, Gio, are you able just to um, introduce the study that this is all based upon to us, please? Sure, yes. So the APAC trial uh, dates uh, back to a period between 2009-2012 where uh, these researchers enrolled patients diagnosed with acute uncomplicated appendicitis that was CT-proven and randomize them to two branches, uh, either receiving uh, a fairly shotgun uh, style antibiotic approach uh, or undergoing surgery. Uh, we'll go a little bit in more details about the types of treatment they received uh, later on. Uh, the aim of that original trial was, well, it was a non-inferiority trial. Uh, so they were trying to demonstrate that antibiotic treatment was non-inferior to surgery. Uh, so if I have to translate this into a PICO type of uh, approach, uh, I would say that patients uh, are patients diagnosed with acute appendicitis, uncomplicated, CT proven, intervention is antibiotics, comparison is standard gold treatment, uh, which would be uh, surgery, and outcomes uh, would be, for the original trial, uh, the um, number of patients that following antibiotic treatment undergo uh, surgery for acute appendicitis. So back to you, Adam. Okay, so um, this was observational follow-up of the original trial that's just been introduced by uh, GEO. That was a multi-center randomized clinical trial comparing a appendicectomy with antibiotics. So that was the APAC trial and that um, took place between November 2009 and June 2012. So thinking about the follow-up for that trial, the last follow-up date, and that's included in this paper that we're looking at today, uh, was May 2018, given a median follow-up of seven years. And um, the quality of life was assessed uh, using a, a validated questionnaire, the EQ5D5L questionnaire. And I think Joe can tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. So. Uh... As the name would suggest, uh, there's five uh, by five elements uh, in this type of questionnaire. So this quality of life, fairly standardized uh, questionnaire assesses five dimensions of life. Mobility, self-care, 
usual activities, so independence in those, pain, discomfort, and finally anxiety, depression. Each dimension is scored by the patient into five levels. No problems, slight problems, moderate problems, severe problems, and extreme problems. The computer then crunches all the results uh, into one number uh, that is the indicator of quality of life for um, the patient. So back to you. Great stuff. So uh, just at this point, if we just summarize where we're at. So this APAC trial, randomized clinical trial, um, back in 2009 to 2012, patients with uncomplicated acute appendicitis, they either had surgery or antibiotics. The, the paper that we're looking at today is in essence the seven year follow up of that trial, but looking more at the quality of life and the patient satisfaction aspect using the questionnaire that we've just mentioned. So thinking about the outcomes, thinking about what we're actually looking at. So if we discuss the APAC trial, you either fell into one of these three groups. The first two were aimed and, and the third group is why as surgeons we kept in work from acute appendicitis. So the patient would come in at the beginning, CT proven acute uncomplicated appendicitis and they were randomized to either have their appendix out or have uh, antibiotic therapy. Unfortunately, and, and initially, and this is a very key point, the randomization down the antibiotic therapy arm commenced with three days in hospital intravenous antibiotics. And then this uh, moved on to um, tablet antibiotics for a period of time after that. And then there's also this third arm, and this third arm were patients who had some form of antibiotic therapy, so came down, um, either started their anti uh, the intravenous antibiotics or had their intravenous antibiotics and then went on to their oral antibiotics. And then at a point after that, they had to have their appendix out nonetheless. So this captures the patients who never got out of hospital with their appendix, i.e. non-operative management was commenced and failed. But it also captures the group of patients who had successful initial treatment of their acute episode but then had recurrent appendicitis some time later and had to have their appendix out nonetheless. So, Jill, can you just tell us about the antibiotic regime and the type of operation that was done in the APAC trial, please? Yeah, of course. So the antibiotics regime, as I mentioned originally, was fairly uh, shotgun style. Uh, so as broad spectrum as possible. Uh, Ertapenem uh, IV for three days, followed by levofloxacin and metronidazole for uh, seven days, so a total of 10 days of antibiotics. The first three IV, the following seven oral. Uh, the operations they underwent um, was, uh, as routine, an open appendicectomy. Uh, in, in some cases, in the original trial, they say that some patients had um, a laparoscopic appendicectomy instead. Okay, thank you. So um, just to kind of give us some more visualization as to what's happened here. And, and in essence, the start of this is, is seven years ago and the end of this or the bottom of this chart is, is the reporting of, of, of this paper. Initially, about 1,400 patients were assessed for eligibility of the original trial, about 850 excluded for various different reasons, which led to randomization of about 500 patients, roughly split 50-50 between those undergoing appendicectomy and those randomized to receive antibiotic treatment. As you can see from this, of the 257 that were randomized to receive antibiotics, 15 of those patients didn't leave hospital with their appendix. So coming to this level here now, which is the um, seven-year follow-up, again, looking down the antibiotic arm, of the 206 patients that they uh, managed to contact by phone for this quality of life and patient satisfaction analysis, um, only 125 of them still had their appendix, so still had that uh, original antibiotic therapy and had not had failure of that or recurrent appendicitis. So 81 patients uh, received antibiotic treatment, which was followed up by later um, appendicitis. Sorry, uh, 14 um, didn't leave hospital with the uh, appendix and one um, got better, so came out of the trial. Uh, and then 67 
at some later date for suspected recurrent appendicitis had appendicectomy. So this links to a trial that actually, uh, sorry, a paper that reported on five-year follow-up geo, and it also yeah. uh, links to the failure of antibiotic therapy that was reported in the original trial. Is that right? Yeah, so uh, if we have to crunch some numbers in sequence, we could say that a failure rate of antibiotic treatment at one year was 27.3%. Failure of antibiotic treatment at five years was 39.1%. And then at eight years, well, we've got it in front of us. So uh, we are hitting uh, around, I wouldn't say 50%, but we are close enough to 50% failure rate uh, of antibiotic treatment. Or, if you want to see it as a glass half full, a 50% chance of getting away with antibiotics uh, when you've got uncomplicated acute appendicitis at eight years. So back to so you, Adam. At eight, yeah, thanks. So at eight years, those patients now that because of the COVID um, epidemic, we are convincing them to have antibiotics, about 50% of those are going to come back within eight years. So... Going back to the aim of this original study, which is quality of life and patient satisfaction, I'm going to just take you through the results in the form of these charts. So if we start over here on this side, um, I'll just introduce the bars. So the, the darker colour bar here is the group of patients that were treated with antibiotics, and the lighter colour bars are those that were treated with appendicectomy. And if we just look at patient satisfaction, again, that's from uh, the questionnaire that Gio introduced earlier. There's no difference in the patient satisfaction uh, between the two groups. Uh, and the model has uh, a good p-value there. With respect to hindsight, so the question is, knowing what you now know, would you have changed your mind in the first, uh, at, at the first attempt? And the answer is no, they wouldn't. Um, there's no difference here between uh, the two groups of patients that would have either changed their mind or had the same treatment or, or were unsure. So to, to get to the kind of meat of this study uh, and to look at the right side now, so appendicectomy again in this teal colour, antibiotic therapy in this beige champagne colour, and then this is the interesting column or, or, or this grey column here. These are the patients that had to have, in essence, two attempts at, at treating their appendicitis. So these are patients that were originally randomised to antibiotic therapy, but at some point after that randomization, they had to have their appendix out nonetheless. And as you can clearly see here, those patients that had, in essence, two attempts at treating their appendicitis were not as satisfied as those that had one attempt from either arm. And there were much more of them that were very unsatisfied and unsatisfied with that treatment. And again, if we give them the opportunity of hindsight, so knowing what you now know, would you have changed your mind? And very few would have gone with the same treatment, although some would have. Oh, you know, this, the figure is up to 36%, but the vast majority of, of these patients that had two attempts to cure their uh, appendicitis would go with different treatment uh, the next time. Numbers are not great in these two uh, models. The p-values are not significant in either. So the conclusions from this trial, relatively simple, relatively straightforward, but are they robust? We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Long-term quality of life is similar after either surgery or antibiotics for treating uncomplicated appendicitis. So if we just quickly and, and finally look at the limitations of the study, and obviously the limitations of this study are linked to the limitations of the original APAC study. So um, could you go through those for us? Geo. Yeah, so, well, we already mentioned about the uh, replicability of their experience uh, with open appendicectomy and the uh, sort of IV antibiotics uh, uh, regime being quite unrealistically used nowadays. Uh, and uh, following that, they also had the recruitment problem, so they had to cut down their original power calculation in terms of um, the number of patients enrolled in the study. I'll be linking the actual study uh, in, uh, in the chat later on. Yeah, so if, if we're thinking about looking at inferring what this study has to our current day practice, the patients that were randomized to receive uh, antibiotics for um, their acute and complicated appendicitis were actually kept in hospital for three days, three days of intravenous antibiotics, and then 
after that point, if they were deemed uh, suitable to go home, then they would go home and they would continue on their uh, oral antibiotics. And not quite sure that that is um, what we would be doing with, with the patients that we're treating with uncomplicated appendicitis. Certainly a lot of the ones that I'm seeing were sending home straight away. So are these uh, the patients in this study less satisfied because actually they still had a three-day hospital stay even if they were just treated with antibiotics. The specific questionnaire um, that we've mentioned throughout this talk has not been validated in Finland despite this being used on a Finnish population. Another key limitation is the fact that this is a bit of an opportunistic study. Um, the original study was set out to answer the question, is it safe to treat uncomplicated appendicitis with antibiotics or not. And this is kind of a, an, a post hoc secondary outcome, um, which is looking at quality of life seven years after the initial event. And as such, there is no baseline quality of life data available. And again, quality of life uh, is difficult to measure, particularly in emergency conditions, which normally has a very short term effect on patients' lives. Um, and that, again, is something that's difficult to quantify, measure and report on. Thank you very much. OK, so we're going to talk about um, types of clinical research, types um, of designs. Right. So uh, when we say clinical research, I guess the first question would be as opposed to what other kind of research. And I thought I should give a very short introduction to research types in general. So. Uh, there are a number of different ways uh, in which you can classify research. And I've got a few um, examples of classification systems. Um, and the most um, elementary is something you probably have all heard of, whereby research is classified into basic and applied research. And essentially, basic research um, aims to advance knowledge in a particular area, whereas applied research is primarily designed uh, and conducted to address you know, practical problems that people face. And with applied research, you have translational on one hand and clinical on the other. Translational research is um, often referred to as bench to bedside research or research that um, takes laboratory findings and uh, uh, makes use of them in the clinic, so lab to clinic research. And I guess that makes sense um, you know, um, of what it actually means. Versus clinical research is where you do research on human participants and uh, looking at the diagnosis, prevention, treatment, and so on of um, human disease. OK, so we'll move on to another kind of uh, classification whereby research is grouped as either qualitative or quantitative. And I guess, as the, as the name suggests, uh, qualitative research refers to uh, um, studies like surveys and studies where uh, you explore behavior, for example, and, and the researcher often gets um, uh, immersed in the um, patients or the uh, um, environment, if you like, and makes observations um, on, on a number of sort of um, general aspects of the condition they're researching or the patients. And the third type is something that we uh, briefly touched upon last time. We talked about um, hypothesis um, testing, and we mentioned about uh, the fact that not all research projects need to have a hypothesis. There could be research with, which is used to generate hypothesis, and there's research which can be used to test hypothesis. So that's another kind of uh, uh, classification um, uh, that you can uh, apply to research projects. OK, so on the right hand side, I've just got a few examples of um, um, the kind of research questions that could be classed uh, into one of these categories. So uh, firstly, you have uh, a, the question, you know, what causes appendicitis or what does the appendix do? So that's a very broad uh, generic question. And that's the kind of a question you would answer in basic research. Then you've got a question that says, could appendicectomy influence immune response in patients with ulcerative colitis? I mean, this is the kind of question that you could answer with um, uh, translational research. So you could be taking blood samples, appendix tissue, and other tissues from patients, look at the immune system, evaluate 
uh, the immune cells, the kind of proteins they produce, the expression of these um, proteins, and so on and so forth. This is, so there's a lot of laboratory work involved, and you can apply these results in practice uh, in, in maybe the management of patients with ulcerative colitis. So that's kind of translational research. If the question is, you know, how do we explore the pathway of care in patients with acute appendicitis? Uh, are we give, um, providing patients with a good service? Um, how do we explore the issues involved in the pathway? So that's um, a good example of qualitative research. Next, um, if you want to look at a large database of hospital, uh, hospital episodes, and in patients with ulcerative colitis, just to try and figure out um, aspects of care in these patients and whether these patients have been subject to interventions like appendicectomy, uh, you are essentially exploring a large database without perhaps a fixed or a predetermined hypothesis, and that would be classed as hypothesis generating research. And finally, if after such a database study, you come up with a hypothesis that says, you know what, appendicectomy has a potential to reduce relapse rates in patients with ulcerative colitis, then that's where you have a hypothesis, and you set out to design a um, study that would then test the hypothesis. So that would be a good example of hypothesis testing research. So um, based on this slide, uh, could I ask Adam um, to um, explain what um, categories this today's article fit into, Adam? Uh, yeah, can you hear me, Sabah? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so quality of life, um, you could look at as a qualitative piece of research. However, um the the tool that was used to measure this uh, gives a, a, a single number uh, at the end of the questionnaire which um, you could argue becomes quantitative uh, research yeah agree and then in terms of Basic versus applied, translational versus clinical. This is clearly a clinical um, project. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and uh, I would say it's applied to address the practical problems. Yeah. And in terms of the last classification, hypothesis generating versus testing. Um. So the. Yeah, you could generate hypotheses based upon this. You've got a number and you've got models that are generated uh, that, that test that hypothesis. Uh, so I think this is a, a hypothesis testing research. The hypothesis being that there's no difference between patients, quality of life who undergo appendicectomy or uh, antibiotic treatment. Brilliant. Yeah, I'd agree. So this is hypothesis testing research. Great. Uh, great. You can hear me? Yep. Okay. There's just a right. bit of interference on the mic, that's all. Okay. Is that better? Yep. Yeah, okay. that's better, Zephyr. Thanks. Right. So we'll crack on with the um, tutorial. So I initially thought I might give a little bit of introduction to what's meant by the scientific method. But I think um, because of time constraints, we'll probably do it another time. And this is only a very brief sort of mention. Um, but I guess I think we should move on. Well, I'm going to leave that there. The slide will be there. And if somebody, if anyone is interested, they could just look it up uh, on the website. So now there are two main categories by which you could classify clinical research. The first one at the top in blue is what we call the experimental um, group or the interventional group. And the other one is the observational group. And essentially, the, the difference between them is uh, pretty straightforward. In the experimental group, you have an intervention or you do something that would alter the natural history of the disease or, or the patient. So you've done something active that has potential to change um, the course of what was due to happen. While in the observational group, you don't do anything active. You simply observe. You simply collect data, ask questions, 
maybe get samples, blood samples, tissue samples, urine samples, whatever it may be. And then you're looking at different things. You're looking at um, markers of inflammation, maybe. You're looking at certain interesting tumor markers. Um, you're doing, you could be doing physical measurements, but you don't do anything that has the potential to interfere with the natural history of the disease. Okay, so those are the two main categories. There is another category of miscellaneous uh, research, which also includes systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Now, systematic reviews and meta-analysis um, is considered by some people not to be pure research or not to be primary research, and they are sometimes grouped uh, under the category secondary research, um, with experimental and interventional categories being primary research. So we're going to be focusing on the um, experimental and observational um, categories for the rest of the talk. Right, so experimental research. Now, um, I'll, I'll um, give you examples um, uh, in relation to the topic that we've been uh, discussing today, that is appendicectomy. So uh, you've probably heard of um, single incision laparoscopic surgery, and that's been employed in appendicectomy as well, and there are a few papers on it. So just keep that in your mind uh, in the background. So one type of interventional research is where you have a single arm, a, a one cohort of patients without controls, and where you intervene or conduct an experiment and um, make some assessment of the outcomes. So you could be introducing cells in your hospital and uh, doing appendicectomy that way, and you're doing that saying there's plenty of other evidence elsewhere that SILS is better uh, in one way or the other, and that would be a single arm study. Now, usually in single arm studies, there are controls, and those controls may be hidden. You could have controls from the literature, and you could say that you're comparing your cohort of SILS patients with patients who've undergone laparoscopic adrenalectomy in another hospital, maybe, or um, patients who've been reported uh, in literature um, to have particular outcomes after laparoscopic appendicectomy. Another way of getting controls would be um, historical controls, or what we call in epidemiology non-concurrent controls. So those could be patients who had appendicectomy at your hospital before you introduced your SILS approach. So that's one kind of exper experimental research. The other more common kind of um, experimental research is the two or more arms control trial, where you have an experimental group and then you have a control group. Now, if you ensure that you have randomized your patients, or in other words, randomly allocated every participant that is entering a trial uh, into one of uh, the various treatment groups, then you've performed a randomized control trial. And I think we'll, we'll do another tutorial just on randomized controlled trials, talking about the, uh, the benefits and also some of the limitations of RCTs. Uh, another group of uh, experimental research studies come under the category of time series, or before and after trials. Now, this is, uh, you're unlikely to encounter this in surgical literature, but this is quite a common um, design in medical literature, whereby, for example, if you want to look at um, the effects of certain analog analgesics on chronic pain, uh, you could subject the same patient to uh, two or three different um, pain medications and assess their pain and quality of life after weeks or months um, of having taken uh, different medications. And the big advantage of this kind of trial is that you have the patient serving as their own control. So uh, there's almost perfect matching if um, you ensure that uh, other um, potential design problems are dealt with. Um, for example, you made sure that you've left enough time between uh, the two drugs for um, the effects to be washed out. Um, so you've got the patients in their own controls and you can evaluate and the relative effectiveness of different pain uh, killers on their chronic pain. So like I said, it's not something we encounter in surgical research. Okay, so let's move on to observational research. So we've talked about um, experimental research or interventional research, and now we're talking about observational research. Now, in most observational research, you need to be um, looking 
for the relationship between different variables. OK, so and the variables can be classed as one of two different types. One is the variables that are associated with or linked to exposure, exposure or risk factor. And the other group of variables are variables that are linked to the endpoint. So keep exposure and endpoint in mind. Now, for example, if you're looking at a study that um, is evaluating the risk of obesity or an infection after appendicectomy, you're looking at obesity being the risk factor and infection being the occurrence of disease. If, for example, you're looking at um, the relationship between um, antibiotics as treatment for appendici appendicitis and, uh, and the outcome of treatment being relapse of appendicitis, then you've got antibiotics as a treatment, which is, in other words, a kind of exposure. And you've got relapse of appendicitis, um, which is the outcome and which is a kind of endpoint. OK, so um, you need to be thinking about what the exposure is and what the endpoint is when you're looking to critique observational research. Now, the um, uh, again, we'll, we'll uh, take appendicectomy and ulcerative colitis, if you like, as an example, while we're discussing um, uh, the, the types of uh, observational research. Now, the first kind of observational research is the so-called case control study. Now, this is a kind of uh, observational study where you're starting off with the endpoint. Now, if you want to look at the relationship between appendicectomy and the development of ulcerative colitis, as an example, you start off with patients who've got ulcerative colitis, and then you've got some healthy controls who've never had ulcerative colitis or who don't have ulcerative colitis. And you look back to see if they've had appendicectomy, or in other words, if they've been exposed to appendicectomy. And then you compare the, the relationship between the risk factor and the disease and the occurrence of disease. So that's a case control study. I'll, I'll talk about it again in a minute. Then the second type of observational research is what we call the cohort study. Here, as opposed to the case control, you're starting with the exposure. So you're starting um, using the same example. You're starting with patients who, who have had appendicectomy and patients who've not had appendicectomy. You followed those patients over time, and that's another key phrase in cohort studies, that you have uh, time as an important element. So you follow these patients over time to see if they've developed uh, ulcerative colitis over the next 5, 10, 15 years, how long you want to design the study for. So that's another type of observation, observational study. A third type is what we call cross-sectional study where you evaluate both the endpoint and the exposure at the same time, at a particular point in time. So prevalence studies are typically cross-sectional studies. Okay, and again, this is not something you come across very often in, uh, in surgical research. There are some other unusual types of observational study. I don't think we will um, uh, we will discuss that in much detail. Um, I've put them on just um, for completion's sake. Ecological studies and proportional mortality studies. Like I said, we'll just um, keep it uh, in the back burner for now. Right. So the most important um, distinction that we need to make is between these two studies, case control studies and cohort studies. And there's a lot of misunderstanding um, around these studies, especially amongst uh, people who are new to uh, epidemiology. So I've got this table here, and I'll go through this table. It's fairly um, sort of intuitive and self-explanatory. So we'll start off with the first row. So in a case control study, you're starting with the endpoint. Like I say, if you're looking at the relationship between appendicectomy and the development of colitis, you're starting off with people with colitis and people without colitis. And then uh, you're looking for the exposure, which is previous appendicectomy. Whereas in a cohort study, you're starting with the exposure, which is have they had an appendicectomy, and then you're looking for the endpoint over a period of time. OK, so uh, keep that in mind. In cohort study, time is critical. You need to make sure that you've designed the study to allow enough time for the endpoint to occur because you're starting off with the exposure. So that's the next sort of rule. So time period is not relevant in case control studies, whereas it needs to be clear and defined in cohort studies. 
Now, you might have realized that doing a case control study with this in particular um, scenario as an example is going to be easy to do and cheap because the exposure has already happened. The, you've got uh, um, people who've got ulcerative colitis and you've got people who are healthy and, and, and then you're just simply looking at the exposure in the past. So it's easy and quick to do. Whereas in a cohort study, you could spend your entire career um, doing a what we call a prospective cohort study. So if you get a cohort of patients with appendicitis as, as who've had appendicectomy and another cohort who haven't, you've got to follow them up for 5, 10, 15 years or longer to see how many get ulcerative colitis in the two groups. So that's the problem with the cohort study. However, the advantages of a cohort study is that there is much less risk of bias and, uh, and, and the opposite is true of a case control study in that there are significant risks of what we call selection bias. There are a number of different types of selection biases. And again, bias will be another topic. But just keep in mind that case control studies are at a significant risk of bias compared to cohort studies. And therefore, not at the ideal kind of study if you're going to look at the relationship between risk factor and um, uh, and an outcome and, and, and disease. But they're quick and easy to do, and therefore they, they're often done in the first instance to look at associations before people then embark on a cohort study. Now, case control studies by definition, because you're starting off with the endpoint, are retrospective in nature. Cohort studies, intuitively you would think that they're all prospective, but there are, there's a certain kind of um, cohort studies uh, that are retrospective. And um, just to explain this a bit further, uh, using our same example, looking at appendicectomy and the development of ulcerative colitis, if you're doing a retrospective cohort study, what you do is you go back in time. You could go back to the year 2000 and look at all the patients who had appendicectomy in Sheffield and, and take another cohort of patients who came into hospital into the surgical unit for conditions other than appendicitis. And then you followed these cohorts over 20 years up to the current year, say 2020, to see how many developed ulcerative colitis in both groups. And clearly here, you followed patients up over a period of time, i.e. 20 years. You started off with the exposure, i.e. whether they had appendicectomy in the year 2000. And therefore you have done a cohort study except that you've gone back in time to identify your cohorts who've, been, uh, who've had exposure. So that is called a retrospective cohort study. A number of surgical studies that you come across in the, in the literature are retrospective cohort studies. So that's why it's important to understand what it means. And um, uh, you will find that a retrospective cohort study has the advantages of a case control study in that it is relatively easy and cheap to do, but also preserves the design advantages of a cohort study in that it is less prone to bias when compared to a case control study. Okay, so I hope that hasn't been too um, confusing, but uh, we'll reiterate this with some examples and, uh, and I've got some questions as well at the end just in case you're wondering. Right, so there are some variants to case control studies and, and I've listed three important sort of um, variants of a typical case control study. I think I'll simply put it up on the screen for you to have a look and see if you can understand what it means. And um, um, be more than happy to take questions um, later on if you did um, go through the slides and had some questions for me. But I'll leave this um, for the sake of uh, uh, finishing on time. OK, so I hope you guys are still here. Yep, yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> right, so shall we start with uh, Geo? Sure. Uh, do, do you want to read this, um, what you can see on the screen? and tell me what you think of uh, what kind of study this is. All right, so 100 newly diagnosed breast cancer patients are interviewed to determine dietary histories. An equal number of healthy first degree relatives, mothers or sisters are interviewed in a similar manner. We compare the proportion of women reportedly history of high dietary fat, con fat consumption in the two groups. So this is a retrospective uh, case control. 
retrospective case control. Well, you don't need to say retrospective when you're saying case control. Absolutely. Because case control studies are almost always retrospective. Yes. Yeah? Okay, very good. So the first thing to say is, you know, is this interventional or is this observational? It's clearly observational. observational. There's no inter inter you know, intervention here. You're not feeding um, fatty food to people. And the second thing then is to say, what's the starting point? Is the starting point, and um, you know, you're starting off with exposure, or you're starting off with endpoint. Here you're starting off with the endpoint, i.e. you've got breast cancer patients and you've got some healthy controls. And then you're looking back to see if they've had the exposure. So this is clearly a case control study. Excellent, very good. Right, shall we um, ask Adam next? So epidemiologists suspect that a specific viral infection in farm workers is caused by exposure to poultry, serum samples from healthy poultry workers and from general population are tested to determine the proportion of individuals positive for avian AV antibody. This is blood tests, different groups. And we are observing the proportion of individuals positive. Um, so this is going to be a cross-sectional study. Yeah, great. Yeah. So um, it's clearly observational and you, I mean, there's no disease population here and they simply um, wa want to look at the prevalence of a particular protein or antibody in a large cohort of people who may be healthy, who may have had the infection. So, and they're looking at this antibody level at a particular point in time. So it's like a prevalence study. So it is a cross-section study. Great. Okay. Uh, ben, shall we go with you next? So GP practices across the region were randomly allocated to one of two groups. One group of practices in which men between 40 and 60 without evidence of coronary heart disease were invited to a treatment group, encouraged to pursue regular exercise, given dietary advice and offered counselling for risk factor avoidance. Another group of practice in which a similar cohort of men were invited for regular medical checks. This served as a control group. Both groups were then followed up for five years and cardiovascular morbidity and survival was compared. So it's a prospective cohort study. Um, anyone would like to differ or... Um, did you explain why, Ben? The first question is, you know, is this interventional or observational? Uh, I think it's... Well, in a way, you're providing an intervention by giving them one group exercise, dietary advice, etc. Um, and the other one... Yeah, uh, just for regular just checks. Actively intervening, yeah. <laughs> so it's got to be an interventional design. Yeah. yeah. And you have a control group. Yeah. So it's a control trial, and and then you've got this phrase randomly allocated. Sure. Yeah, random randomized control. Yeah. There'll be a randomized control trial. Now, uh, the thing to keep in mind is. Obviously, you'll get a lot more detail when you critique a paper. The methodology will make it clear. Sometimes the title will make it clear. But often the title and the methodology do not make it clear. And uh, uh, some studies are frankly misleading. So um, you obviously need to be able to figure out what the design is. And then we can um, understand the results and the inferences better. So um, here you got the phrase random allocation or randomization. So these um, phrases are giveaways in, va in that if you have uh, such a sort of uh, phrase, then it means it is a randomized control trial. The odd thing about the study is that practices were randomized. So uh, they haven't randomized individuals, individual men. They've randomized practices in which the practice that gets allocated to treatment will have a physiotherapist, a dietitian, and, the, and a psychologist. And the practices that are allocated control uh, to the control arm will not have these additional sort of um, uh, 
interventions. And this is a, a example of what we call a cluster randomized control trial, wherein the unit of um, randomization is not a patient, but a group of patients. OK. Right. Shall we do one more and then um, we'll open up for questions? Yeah, we have time. Yeah. Is um, Josh here? No. Yeah, yeah. I'm here. Josh, I'm sorry. I think you've got the most difficult one. Do you want to have a go at this? So we compare a driver's use of mobile phone at the estimated time of a cash crash with the same driver used during another suitable time period. Because drivers are their own controls, the design controls of, uh, for characteristics of a driver that may affect the risk of a crash but do not change over a short period of time. Uh, it is important that risk during control period and crash trips are similar. We compare phone activity during the hazard interval with phone activity during control intervals, equivalent time during which participants were driving but did not crash in the previous week. I am sorry, Josh. Uh, You've got no code one. So it is a um, observation study because it did not provide any intervention. Very good. OK, so that, that's where you start. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so the exposure is the um, the use of phone. Yeah. Use of phone and then you compare the two endpoints. Yeah, and the endpoints are the crash. Yeah. And you so start a off... case control study then is that or yeah, correct, oh. correct. So you're starting off with people who crash, right? And then yeah. you're looking at their own use of phone sometime um, before. So essentially, yeah. it's a case control study. The slight oddity being that the drivers are, the, are their own controls. Yeah, so you it's clearly, a crossover. Yeah, so it is clearly a, a case control study because you started off after the, uh, the endpoint has happened, after the crashes have happened. OK, and you're looking at uh, previous exposure. Right, great. So this is a case control study with a slight um, uh, variant. Lovely, right. Let's uh, wrap this up. So we talked about types of research. We haven't really talked and uh, spent much time talking about the scientific method, but that'll be for another um, uh, time and day. We talked about clinical research designs. So the key, um, the first uh, categorization um, is to differentiate research into experimental and observational. We talked a little bit about experimental studies, but we spent some time on observational studies and talked about the differences between case control studies and cohort studies and, and what the differences are between case control and cohort studies. Keep in mind that cohort studies could be retrospective cohort studies and or prospective. Okay, so we'll end there. Thank you very much.